Um, I was organizer for the Women's Pentagon Action here in D.C. for um, I think two years. So I knew about the encampment and I didn't attend, I attended a meeting in, in the spring, I believe, of 83. And I was uh, leaving D.C. I was working for the National Moratorium on Prison Construction, which was a project of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. And so that position was ending and I decided in my mind, without discussing it with anyone else, that I was going to live at the encampment for a year. And there wasn't any plan that it was going to exist for a year, but that was my plan, was to live there through the first year. And yet, it was in the spring of 83 that I made that plan. So then, and then I attended one meeting, and then I did a trip, and then I, I went and started living there in June. Maybe, maybe more than one meeting, one or two meetings. So I knew a number of the women organizing because we were involved with Women's Pentagon Action together. We were very excited. I was, uh, being in D.C., I was coordinating housing for the event. Um, so. Women came, came from buses, came, uh, there were busloads of women came, coming from places. Um, women came in cars. Uh, we had this vision of having a ritual as part of, of, of that. So we had mourning, rage, empowerment, defiance. So those were the four. The, Stages, we call it, right, with stages. Um, I, I don't remember if it was all, just the last action or the first one. Um, and we had lots of chants about women, uh, you know, take the toys away from the boys. And um, as we were preparing for the Women's Pentagon action, I don't remember if it was the first or second year I worked on it, I, I went on a tour of the Pentagon, sort of. And that was really scary. You know, I went by myself just like be a tourist and uh, went on this tour, you know, and they give you this tour. And even back in 83, they had a meditation room, you know, to pray for peace in the Pentagon. And um, it was really horrible. And, and on the tour, they told you things like how many light bulbs they used, you know, like important pieces of information. Um, and those two actions women got arrested and women spent some time at uh, Alderson Federal Correctional Institution. Um, I didn't do that, but we, um, I spent 10 days in the D.C. jail, um, nine days for that, for that action. I would say probably not to be, a, just I would say several thousand. Um, and Women were in affinity groups, you know, it was the nonviolent structure of affinity groups being arrested. Um, we, blo we were t attempting to blockade the Pentagon. So we had, you know, groups like we had a DC Women's Pentagon Action, there was a Boston Women's Pentagon Action, a Philadelphia Women's Pentagon Action, New York, Ohio, I think. I mean, so there were groups of women who were organizing in their community for this event. And the f to go to the Pentagon, I mean, to actually see it and, you know, it's very powerful because to know that those decisions are being made there, you know, these military decisions. And, and to have some, we didn't have a lot of encounters with people, but we were blockading, so we had some people walking through. Um, one of the two years we had, the day before we had workshops and, you know, preparation in D.C. and I, I have thought about looking up this woman, what happened about it, but there was a, a, an African-American woman who was doing um, organizing around ho uh, homelessness and poverty issues related to housing in the D.C. area. I don't remember her name, but she had recently been killed, and so uh, we, we named the event. Somehow we honored her um, in this event. Um, and it wasn't clear, like, was she killed because she was organizing? Was it just random street violence? You know, what, what was it? Um, and I don't know if anything, I've never remember reading anything about her. I don't know what happened. So we had lots, Women's Pentagon Action continued. Like, we had uh, Emma Goldman birthday celebration um, at the park across from the, uh, the White House and fun, fun feminist silly events, you know, as, as the local women's Pentagon action. Yeah. Oh, it was crazy. 
because there was so much to do. There was um, all the physical logistics, which being a middle-class white woman who lived in urban areas, I didn't know anything about sewage systems or water systems or anything like that. And I wasn't involved with it, but I knew that had to be happening and to be going on. And that just just doing that part was huge. And then we, you know, I was doing the organizing in terms of getting the housing. I started doing housing again, coordinating housing, doing networking with other peace organizations with local organizations so it was just overwhelmed. I have this memory of something not terribly shameful but a little I, I felt bad I remember in July of 83 there were these two women who cycled to the camp and and um, they were I don't know how long they were gonna stay I didn't know them and I just overwhelmed them with all the things that we had to do and they left the next day you know. <laughs> so it was like I probably they probably decided not to stay because of me because I just felt so overwhelmed and they looked like they, like they could you know help us out and I, um, so I felt overwhelmed with all all the work and because of the time frame of the big action I was one of the organizers for the August first action so oh, it was a lot a lot to do and I had never been in that kind of rural environment I mean we were, you're out in the woods at the camp. The primitiveness that wasn't, that wasn't, but it was a, just, it wasn't that I was uncomfortable with the primitiveness in terms of not having toilets or things like that, but it was more being out in the country. Um, you know, the, con the contrast of organizing an event, mimeograph machines, you know, <laughs> telephones, and then you're out in the country. I remember uh, Coyote once giving me a compliment and saying, Leanne, you, you do a lot of dishes, you know. <laughs> so, you know, because there certainly were lots of class issues um, at the camp that, that went on, and I, um, in my own way, attempted to break through those and, you know, participate. Um, and I remember a couple of women who were, um, what do we call them, grunts, um, were like, Leanne, why don't you come out and do plant some comfrey in the compost bed, you know, so I went out and planted the comfrey in the compost bed. Or um, the, the fall of 83, there were lots of women, maybe 20 or 30 of us living, camping and living in the house that, that first year. And um, as best I could, I was in my own way uh, attempting to bridge the gap between various groups of women and um, there were many disturbing incidences that happened um, that were disappointing to me with women and attitudes around class and uh, prejudice. So um, I was living, you know, as I said, I had made this plan within my own mind that I was going to be there for the year. And uh, I remember, um, I can't remember her, name, her last name now, Susan, who was with War Resisters League, so I knew her from the encampment. Susan Pines, um, and she said, oh, Leanne, you, I, I'm so glad to hear you're going to stay there for the year, because sh she trusted me, she knew me, you know, and so that made her happy, and I was happy that she was happy, but I wasn't happy that there was this bias and prejudice against these other women who were at the camp who were uh, fringe, lesbian, hippie, gypsy women, you know, who I knew and I trusted, and they were there with me. So that was difficult, you know, like, well, you're okay, but we're not sure about them. And, um, and that happened again and again, that, that kind of attitude um, that happened at meetings where, well, we want, you know, women who are going to work to be at the camp. And when are they working? Well, what's work? And um, I remember a meeting in Ithaca where there were a group of women from New York City and here we are there's women from other parts of the world and they said well I'm from the city <laughs> it's like these are women who are supposed to understand the world and think thinking global and they're at this meeting and they say I'm from the city you know and in New York State where there's uh, you know some tension with people from New York City and other parts of the state there's a tension there and the, so those are some of the things that happened, but um, I had, 
and I'm definitely you know a middle class white girl so but I wanted to be more open and to be you know then the intention is to be respectful of diversity and appreciate diversity and and I was living at the camp and I did appreciate um, you know that like women were painting the house there were a bunch of women that were painting the house which was a big project and hard work and I so I painted the house a bit and I remember I don't remember who it was but maybe more than one woman saying you know help paint the house and I was like yeah that makes sense we have to do it together but there were some women who were afraid in terms of class distinction and they did not want to paint the house they wanted to stay in the office they were I think they were afraid they didn't get it and I tried to get get them say you know do a little bit of the painting of the house not that you're not going to do what you have your skills and knowledge about but do a little you know do a little of the painting the house in the same way you know when I would go out to do speaks I remember trying to get Thundercloud to come with me and she was afraid to and was like come on come, come with me you know so trying to to get women to do both you know just to open ourselves up to different skills and different experiences and to break those class you know keep on breaking those class things so I think I I got someone to come with me once or twice because I was comfortable speaking I was doing you know talking to the media I mean those are all comfortable things for me to do I don't think I got TC to come but I remember like trying to get some folks who were more the uh, doing the outdoor work kind of working class women to come come with me so the distinction between the grunts and the clipboards was kind of something that that was very real at the camp. Absolutely, and, and, and made me sad. You know, it did make me sad because decision making at these, um, at the regional meetings, we called them, which were where women from different parts of the country who were involved in decision making would come together. And there was, you know, this attitude well, like, we trust you, Leanne, but, you know, those other gypsy women, you know, with names like Coyote and Twilight, like, we don't we don't trust them. I mean, no, it wasn't so much said out loud, but it was definitely there. Well, they would say, I trust you, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that was definitely, so it was lifestyle, it was class, you know, um, I mean, there were lesbians in all those circles, but, so it wasn't lesbian, but it was that, that free, op uh, free kind of gypsy lifestyle versus, you know, organizer, have a house, have a job so that's with some some going on um, I remember I was at a uh, regional meeting and we were in the in the bathrooms you know in the stalls and there were two women who were talking who I knew from Women's Pentagon Action one was from New York City and one was from Boston I think and um, and they were talking about if the camp should go on according to you know their opinion and it was it was we don't trust those other women because they don't fit in you know they didn't say that all but it was because they aren't part of our circle you know we don't trust them we don't want them to continue those those hippie kind of women so and and they were in the stalls it was like I couldn't even talk to them because they were both in the stall and they didn't know I was there and it really um, you know, I would say I still don't trust those two women from hearing them talk the way they did. There's some level, of, I just don't trust them. So the women from Women's Pentagon Action, I knew most of them, they had been involved with War Resisters League. They had been in FOR. They, you know, they, they had been involved in these kind of uh, heterosexual structural organizations. So th even though they were lesbians or feminists, they still knew each other from those structures. Whereas these other women that were coming in were, were coming in from the lesbian consciousness of fem feminism. And so they didn't know about War Resisters League. They hadn't been to lots of anti-war demonstrations. They, but they were all activists, you know. They were all living their lives. All of those women, you know, were making choices every day on, on justice and feminism, but f coming from different places. And that was an exciting thing also, you know, to, to have um, women who, who hadn't been involved with peace to, to experience um, the peace movement and, and see what, what we were doing um, around disarmament issues. I want to say one more story about, like that that happened again in the fall of 83. Um, 
in October of 83, there was a big demonstration, uh, civil disobedience action, a national demonstration at Seneca Army Depot, which um, was a regional, it was sponsored by a regional organization that I, that I was maintaining a relationship with, you know, a number of women were, but I was one of the people attending those meetings regularly and uh, from the encampment. And um, there was going to be an interfaith, I don't remember if it was interfaith or interdenominational, which would be interdenominational would be Christian only and interfaith, I think it was supposed to be interfaith, you know, prayer service before the, the event. And so I was involved with that. And I was... I wanted the Wiccan tradition to be represented because, not that I was practicing it, but because that was part of the camp and we were part of the event. But I wasn't going to say Wiccan to these Christians in rural New York State in 83. So it was like, well, I was saying a feminist. Can Let's have a feminist presence, you know. And so I was trying to push it and, and they finally got accepted. And so then I wanted, so I went to the peace camp women who were witches and asked who would do that because I'm not a witch, you know? And they were like, oh, no, no, we don't want to do it. We're afraid we don't want to do it. So I said, okay, well, then I decided, okay, I would do it, but I still wanted someone else because I'm not a witch. I, you know, I was trying to present, make a space for the witches. So um, finally, I got Coyote and I did it, you know? And, uh, and I was up on the stage with all these ministers. <laughs> And Coyote, like, at, we did a prayer and a song, and as soon, I think she played her guitar, and we did Listen to My Heart song, Listen to My Soul song. And um, then she, like, disappeared. She escaped. I didn't even find her, like, when I went back up to the stage to sit down. Um, and the, and, and they, on the program, they put a feminine perspective. <laughs> But, you know, it was good. And several women who I didn't know, you know, came up to me because it was a big event and who, who were feminists. And it was, oh, thank you. It was, so, it was so good to have you there. That was so real. You know, it was so beautiful. <laughs> that was so funny. Ongoing. There were workshops regularly. Um, I remember um, Andrea brought in some women who for a whole like we did a whole work a whole weekend together around class um, that was very powerful so and there were lots of one-on-one -on -one discussions but what I was talking to you about was my own personal thing in that that in very intense time where we were just running around um, and those kinds of unfoldings and recognitions I think you know they did happen um, and the encampment was a place where we took the time to to do those kinds of things um, and sometimes just to attempt to do them but we had the time we took the time to do them where when you know when you're just going to a meeting and going home you don't make the time to have those kind of dialogues or experience those kinds of things you know so it was very empowering for me too to use a hammer for, and, and do those things and see women being independent um, with those kinds of skills with security and um, you know, Mary Hilton having these elaborate systems for the water and you know negotiating I mean we were all negotiating with various authorities with our different skills whether it was the police or the health department so I saw that kept on happening yeah the intensity I had experienced in some way at Women's Pentagon Action of, you know, us as a group of women empowered with each other and facing the Pentagon, you know, that, that intensity of emotion and the reality of, um, as best we could, of, you know, all this energy going into militarism and how that meant that, how that means that we we don't have human resources and human services. So I had experienced that a little bit and I think we, we had some of us women because when we come together, we, you know, there's a presence that happens, an experience. But the living together, um, we didn't really talk about that or have a sense of that, I don't think. I don't think we discussed that really in meetings, in, in uh, making plans. I had lived in community before and I, had, I was interested in community, so that was one of the reasons I, you know, I was planning to live at the encampment was because I was interested in intentional community.
but we didn't really think about that. It was, you know, some sometimes, you know, one of the tensions was, well, not sometimes, all the time there was this ongoing tension of the encampment being uh, our political positions of opposition to the military, of fe feminism, of opposition to violence. Um, so sometimes we would get, you know, we would, that ebb and flow, we'd get lost with not remembering also then that the intention of living together in community and what nonviolence means in in community. And it's, uh, I would always say, you know, it's very easy to have a meeting and then go home to your own house, but at the encampment we, we couldn't go home because we were home. So we didn't have all those supports, all those comfortable support systems to go back and forth with. And um, so it made it raw, yeah, for many times made it raw. We, you know, we would do regularly do nonviolence trainings to prepare women for civil disobedience action. And there was a woman who was living at the camp who um, had been a vet, a military vet, and um, I believe she probably had also been involved with um, a, uh, a political party that, that um, did encourage, accept using violence for liberation. And so I said, you know, for this demonstration, we are agreeing to use nonviolence. And um, afterwards, she, she thanked me how I was so clear about it, you know, because I, I didn't, wasn't saying we're all nonviolent all the time or we're all agreeing to be nonviolent all the time, but I was saying for this event, you know, this is the agreement. And that gave her space to, to be at that event. So that's what, what we tried, I think some of us tried to do was to say, okay, for now, this is what we're agreeing to, you know. Um, so one of those tensions was separatism. You know, certainly there were women who were separatists, but they were willing to be with women who weren't separatists within the context of the camp. So, so that was you know, a difference, maybe a utopia difference, where there were women who, who wanted to live in separatist, but they were willing to be at the camp, which was not separatist. I'm thinking of, of incidences, um, so I'm just gonna you know, go where I'm going. I had a, a friend visiting who um, I knew from activism, and he was German, and he hitchhiked to visit me at the camp. And then, he, so he hid in the bushes <laughs> because it was all these women, and he was waiting to see me. But like, like you know, he couldn't. He couldn't just like find me, and so he hid in the bushes. And he wrote this little note, and he it was in a, made it into a little ball, and he gave it to some woman. And then I found it, and then I found him in the bushes, <laughs> and that he ended up. There was a, a woman at the camp whose boyfriend was living at, at um, Samson State Park, you know, camping. So then he stayed with him. That worked out. But like for those few hours when he arrived, he was hitchhiking. It was like, um, and then there was another incident. I know. So he was respectful of it being a women's space, but we were trying to, you know, deal with this situation. There was another man who, um, there was uh, the Nipponza Mahoja, the Japanese Buddhist monks had and nuns had organized a walk. And so that was a, um, you know, men and women walk. And so one of the people was really, really ill. The man was very, very ill. And uh, I know a woman like hid him in somewhere in the house, like for a night because he was ill, you know, and that was her decision. Like, but she hid him, you know, and he knew he was being hidden. You know? um, so there was, uh, I think we tried to respect each other sometimes. Um, I had a bad incident once where, well, it wasn't a bad incident. It was a funny incident where there was a, uh, a, a winter demonstration. And remember the camp, you know, it's bitter cold in upstate New York. And um, there were, were press at the demonstration. And so they came to the house and it's bitter cold, you know, there's no, public restrooms or anything in, in Romulus <laughs> and this woman who's you know in her high heels and her suit and her stockings and she wants to use our restroom and I said well we don't have one you have to go to the outhouse and she was so upset she really thought I was lying to her 
um, you know, but it was like, no, we don't have a toilet in the house. And, um, so there were some incidents I'm thinking about with like male press where, you know, they would want to come in and we'd have to try to tell them, no, you can't. It's hard to remember. Well, I would say that sometimes, you know, there was a tension where um, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying I was bisexual or there was an expectation everyone was a lesbian, which is not separatism, but it's going in that direction. Um, and I accepted that because, I mean, we're living, you know, the dominant culture is heterosexual, the dominant culture is men's world. So when we're trying to build something else, it can go in the other direction. Um, I think there were times where I, I didn't go to certain events or hang out with certain women because I felt like I wasn't welcome, um, you know, when there were larger groups and circles of women times. Uh, sometimes that was also substance abuse issues, which I didn't fully comprehend until years later because um, I wasn't doing substance. So I wasn't thinking other women were, and so I wasn't thinking, oh, that's what's going on. But then looking back, I can see, yeah, that's, that's what was going on. You know, even though we had policies about substance in terms of alcohol or um, illegal drugs being used, we had p policies, but women didn't follow them. At that time, um, and I don't know what's happening today, but in the, in the early 80s, there, there was sadomasochism was, was going on in, in the lesbian community, in the women's community, and I was abhorred by it um, because I came, I came to the encampment out of nonviolence, and some women came out of women, you know, so those different, different streams that bring us together and bringing together is good. But I was absolutely clear that sadomasochism didn't belong at the encampment and was not something I wanted to be around or near. And um, I remember there was uh, some music going on with some groups, some women's groups from Ithaca, and um, this woman was on the stage and she said, I'm wearing my black and blue. And uh, I just got up and laughed. It just freaked me out. It's like, this is, what is this doing here? It's just so disturbing to me. And uh, I remember another time there was going to be a party at Northwoods, and someone told me, well, it's going to be some, you know, SM kind of stuff. I said, okay. Not, I'm not going, no thank you, no interest. Um, and that would come up periodically at the camp, that kind of stuff, and that was very disturbing to me. Uh, and I had an incident, which it took me a few days to sort it out, but I was uh, in the sunk-in room at the camp, and on the Butch Femme continu Continuum, I was a femme, actually, I, was, I wore skirts a lot that first summer, and Twilight thought it was because I was a Christian and that I, I believed only wearing skirts. I was just, I like wearing skirts and it was summer. <laughs> so, so I was a, butch, a femme on the Butch Femme Continuum. And um, there, it was during the day and there were women around. We were you know, working in the office and this woman who I knew came down and threw me down on the floor and climbed on top of me. And like, you know, you know, like put her legs between my legs, like didn't hurt me, but threw me down the floor, like, and she wanted to kiss me or touch me. And there was a woman at the top of the stairs who also I knew, and she said, I don't think Leanne likes that. And, and then she got up and left. And, and it took me days to, to think about that and was like, that was a violation. Well, that was horrible. What, what was that about? Um, and it freaked, you know, it was very upsetting. I wrote, I wrote her a letter which got returned, you know, the address I finally had for her that I tracked down didn't work. So that was, that's how that ended. So I have to say that separatism, there's, I associate some of that kind of stuff with separatism. Separatism is bigger than that, but that, some of that kind of energy came from some of that kind of separatism. And so it's not, not stuff I, I'm, ha I'm just comfortable with, I was happy with. And, and things I think are dangerous for society and dangerous for women. That kind of thing, I can't I say that's, that I don't 
can't say. But there certainly were mediations where there were uh, interpersonal conflicts, um, where women would go, you know, to someone, they, another woman they respected, and said, "Help us negotiate. You know, help us talk." So I know there were mediations, and sometimes there were mediations that I didn't even know there was a conflict because I wasn't directly involved. But then I would hear, "Oh, there was this, you know, meeting that happened with these two or three women." So there were wise women who were around who had skills to help with those kinds of things. One of the, the uh, ways of meetings that was, I think, very um, interesting and powerful was periodically we would say, okay, keep on this, you know, so to let, let that other aspect of our, of our thinking yeah, be integrated into the decision making. So that was very beautiful. And when you have a meeting that's a couple of days, you can do that. We had well, we had the song right. This is the old meeting. This is the new meeting. This is the same meeting longer than before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we had sometimes at points we would have daily meetings for uh, work meetings. We'd have work meetings where we plan the tasks of the day, um, organize volunteers. We would have decision-making meetings, we had regional meetings, we had, and then there were meetings with the public. Um, I was, you know, this is not a question you're asking, but um, with, I can't remember the name of the organization, Seneca, oh no, Finger Lakes Peace Alliance, which was, um, the, you know, the group that had been doing, one of the groups doing actions at the base for years. Uh, which was an alliance of, of various organizations, and I was attending those meetings as a peace camp woman. And there was a man who was longtime organizer, and he said to me at the meeting, "The peace camp will continue over my dead body." I'm like, okay, <laughs> that was pretty intense. And he did turn around. I heard oh, as the years passed. That was pretty intense to try to, you know, attend meetings with someone with that kind of attitude. By the winter, there were like four to eight of us, I would say, and it was very difficult because we were, I mean, for, for folks that grew up in middle class U.S., that was very difficult. It was very primitive. Um, I didn't drive. We had like one car sometimes. I remember... Um, there was a sick cat in Asia hitchhiked to like to take the cat to the vet. I mean, you're hitchhiking in rural New York with a cat, you know. But we didn't have a car, or there was one car. One person had a car, um, and all the effort to like just take a shower and negotiate with our friends in the community. That please, can I <laughs> take a shower? It was very humbling. Um, I did not, I was too innocent, not innocent, I was too shy to participate in the, um, the strip, um, strip poker games that would go on in the sunken room and the winter women would just decide they had to heat up the house and they would play strip poker, but I was too shy at that, at that point. Um, and then we'd take, we'd occasionally some women would heat up water and take a bath. I don't know how they did it. I remember Cassie, who was a petite little woman, she did it, but I don't know who else did that. So that was just physically difficult. Lived with, I had always lived in an urban area prior to that. So, and walking out to the outhouse, um, I remember Thundercloud like putting ashes from the f fire on the, gla on the ice so that you, w you could walk more carefully. Um, and all those kinds of, the daily life, I mean, I didn't know about it. No. And who would tell you about it? I don't know. How do you find out about it? Like, oh, we have, we have to clean, clean the stovepipe twice a year or something. What are you talking about? <laughs> no. And there were various opinions. I remember, I don't remember her, what her name was now, but there was a woman that, that first year who, um, that first winter, who would always get up early in the morning and she would sweep all the carpets and sweep the floor because she you know, wanted to make the house nice, which was very nice. So then I would never woke up that early. I would wake up and that would be nice. Um, there were substance abuse issues going on sometimes, you know, where clearly women were doing too much of something or other. That was 
would go on sometimes. Um, well, the fall and then continuing the winter was, was that harshness going on, not only, but of women on, on the land and women off the land. You know, that, that was going on. Well, we were um, maintaining our presence at the base so women were um, monitoring, uh, using binoculars to monitor the base, going around the base, you know, keeping up with as best we could what was going on, what was coming and going, who was where, you know, what gate was open, um, those kinds of things we were doing. We were um, doing the community organizing. We were start. We were doing speaking engagements. We were talking to the media regularly. Um, we were corresponding with people. We were in terms of other peace activists with the encampment women and other places responding to letters uh, we were dealing with the media we, st we were having visitors people were coming through um, and we were planning for the next summer and maybe part of it was part of the time we did what hadn't been decided but some of us were de had decided <laughs> you know, that we were gonna have a next summer um, and then just daily life, which is was take a lot of time when you're in a rural area. We were doing lots of speaking engagements in the area, you know, regularly. That was something that I did a lot of. It was pretty much the same, and then responding to the audience. It was about the base, about the crews in Pershing two missiles, um, and about our structure, our feminist our cooperative structure, our inclusiveness in terms of issues. Um, you know, that was, attention was like, why are you talking about all these other issues? You know, you should be just talking about nonviolence. You know, that sort of thing was, was an issue. I'm going to tell a little personal, some personal story, which you may or may not know about me. So then, I don't know, you know, thinking back, it's like, how did I decide to do this? But I was committed to living very simply, um, at, coming out of college, and I had, um, decided to live below the taxable income level as a form of war tax resistance. So I was living very simply. Um, the, sec the summer, well, Women's Pentagon Action, I, was, I knew Nancy, Nancy Alec, and Nancy Alec had gone to Europe and visited feminists and visited peace movement in Europe. And so I knew about the, fe the peace movement in Europe. And I decided that part of my commitment to going to the encampment was in solidarity with European people, because they were they were having the weapons deployed to their countries, to those five five countries. So I realized that in order to complete my commitment, I needed to go to Europe to meet and visit the peace activists in Europe to say, "Hey, I'm a U.S. woman, and you know we were we were doing this in solidarity with you." So um, then, in December of 84, then I went to, to Europe and I did um, a self-created nine-month tour of, um, in Europe and visited um, nine or eleven countries and did 40 presentations about the encampment to uh, Europeans, um, to feminists and to peace activists. And I had Europeans cry. You know, I had people say, I knew there was a peace movement, you know, but I'd never met anyone. So they met me, you know, and, and so then I was like, that's when I completed my commitment at the encampment was, was that, that trip. No, I just did it. <laughs> I just did it. I mean, some women knew I did it, but I just did it. Because, because the encampment was that we were speaking for ourselves. I, w I wasn't speaking for anyone else besides myself. I mean, I had some, I had slideshows, I had literature, but I was speaking for myself. So I had Nancy Alex address list and I had Peace Camp address list and there I was. I, I, I came to understand a little bit of some of the differences between Greenham and the encampment. Yeah. I would say more than 50% of the women at Greenham were on the dole. They were getting, you know, money they were on subsidies from the federal, from their government, which was not the case at the encampment. Um, I remember the summer of 83, in the following year, I found out like one woman was on unemployment compensation, you know, who was living there that summer. So the bulk of us were not, so that's a very different thing. I said more than 50% at Greenham were, were on the dole. And at Greenham, 
they had common land, so so the, legally the issue was different than than at the encampment. In the United States, we don't have something called common land, so it's not an argument we could have even made. So women bought, you know, bought the land in order to create a safe place for women to have ongoing demonstration outside the base. So sometimes women didn't understand that difference. It was just, it was a very legal difference. And Green and women were, would like make fun of us because we had this house, but it was like, well, we couldn't do what they did. I mean, we really couldn't because it's a different situation legally. They could, they could argue that common ground issue and stay in, beyond the land around the base, but we couldn't do that. It was wonderful to be there. And, uh, I was there. I went to Greenham a few times, and, um, and during the nine months, and I, I went, yeah, during the nine months. And the one of the times after I had been traveling in Europe, and I went back to Greenham, this woman said, like, she liked me better because I, I didn't have that brash U.S. Fa fast thing, you know. I, I had changed and become more European or something, you know. And I was, I'm sure it was true, but I couldn't. I didn't know what it was exactly or conceive of what it was, but I could appreciate that I was probably different, you know, and, and she was more comfortable with me the second time or third time I, I ran into her. And there were lots of things in common, I think. I remember I was disappointed with this woman, this woman who was like vegan, and she was this vegan, you know, and she was like, People were bringing hot food in the back of their trucks for us to eat you know, in the winter time because I spent Christmas at Greenham. And she was like, it wasn't good enough for her because it wasn't vegan. And then she was eating this candy bar. And I, and I knew the candy bar was not vegan. You know? <laughs> this like got me mad. <laughs> The, the urgency of, um, of these nuclear weapons being deployed. And um, I, I, I lived with the possibility of us really harming the planet with those nuclear weapons. And as a U.S. citizen, I felt a great responsibility to, be, to show the Europeans that, that they were not alone, that there were U.S. people who opposed that. So those, those were the reasons I did it. So those, those didn't change. I had nothing to do with what was going on personally or individually with people.